<laughs> All right. So, so before I get started, I want to talk a little bit about um, what internet marketing can do for a particular business. And in fact, this particular business that I'm going to talk about is a co-client of Action Coach and 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 eWeb Style. And the company is Manning Pool Service. They're a, a pool service company that had about 40 maintenance contracts and were actually ready to close their doors. Uh, they, it, she had actually, the owner, Susan Manning, had actually reached out to her accountant and said, uh, how do I close my business and interrupt you know, uh, the, the fewest people possible? She came on with Action Coach, Action Coach sent her to us. In less than two years, she has 240 maintenance contracts, pool contracts. She's expanded trucks, she's expanded territory. So a well-run internet marketing campaign and of course coaching uh, can send you in the right direction for growing your business. One of the questions we often ask is, how big would you like your business to get? Because if it's not very big, we have to tailor what we do. So I just wanted to share that story. Why is internet marketing so important? Has anybody seen uh, or read the Duct Tape Marketing? It's a book called Duct Tape Marketing. It's, a, it's an amazing book. It's pretty thick and it's very, very dense. So you can really read like the first chapter and walk away with a hundred things that are, uh, you know, boiling through your head about things to do. Uh, so I recommend it. And if you do read it, read it in very small sections and apply those things because there's nothing worse than having a thousand things that you can do and not doing anything, right? So make sure you take it in bits and pieces. Uh, what I like about this, I, this is a great quote about marketing. Uh, marketing is getting someone who has a need to know, like, and trust you. And that's true on the internet. There's a video is a great way to actually get people to like and trust you. It's one of the, uh, the few ways that you can be incredibly, that you can get a lot of emotion from people or in, in, instill a lot of emotion into people. So Nolan's gonna talk about some video. So just real quick, this is our uh, itinerary for today. We're gonna talk about how to get your message in front of people, how to make those people become targeted leads, how to, make, uh, how to use emotion to connect and motivate those people, and then strategies. Nolan has a slew of strategies. He will go through them quickly. You might wanna prepare your notes because uh, he goes through them very quickly and they're all very great ideas. Um, big thank you, BBVA Compass. This facility is amazing. Uh, they, they coordinate it for us on a monthly basis. Uh, we may end up doing those more, and obviously Bits Inc. is Nolan's company, and eWeb Style is mine. I was told that you're supposed to take a little bit of time and talk about you, the speaker. So this is me, the speaker. I've been in Houston since 1983. Doesn't that make me a native? Yeah. I think it's a native. Like, everyone I meet is from somewhere else. Um, my first company was SES Research. I started that in 1991, a carbon nanomaterial manufacturing business. I uh, started eWebStyle. I've been married for six to seven years now uh, and have twins who are five years old. Uh, owner of eWebStyle, which I started in 1999. I think that's on the next slide. And this is good. There's actually a flyer in front of you. Tune into our weekly podcast. Uh, I'll talk about what that podcast is. You can actually learn, continue to learn information uh, about internet marketing on a regular basis. So the three main things that, that, uh, that we should say about eWebStyle, we're an internet marketing uh, agency established in 1999, <coughs> and we are the host of the most popular internet marketing podcast on iTunes, also SEO podcast. Does anybody listen to podcasts? Well, okay, good, that's actually pretty good. Um, if anybody doesn't, doesn't listen to podcasts or doesn't know what they are, they're actually just 30 minute audio shows that we put onto iTunes and you can download and listen to, or you can listen to them on our website. What does it mean to have a podcast? Well, the most popular internet marketing podcast, this is a map. Each of these pins is a, a, a pin in a country where our podcast has been downloaded. So we've been downloaded in more than 83 different countries and we get great, uh, great referrals. We actually put a lot of liveliness into our podcast as well as um, uh, give a lot of great information. So uh, if you want, there's a link. You can check out our podcast and continue to get great information from us. So there's a number of aspects of uh, internet marketing and these are just a few of them. Uh, web design is of course very important. How do you market on the internet if you, uh, if you don't have a website? Um, search engine optimization. Has everyone heard of search engine optimization? Yes, so we know, yeah. So about a year ago, maybe two years ago, the answer might have been, there would have been a lot more no's. Now it's becoming more and more, people are more and more aware of what it is. Um, does everyone know exactly what search engine optimization is? Not the tasks that cause it to do well, but what it is, what, what you're trying to accomplish? I love your tagline. 
Google gets you first on Google. Yeah, first page on Google, right? right? That's that's the target. And there's actually a couple positions on Google. Some you can buy. Those are pay per click. We mentioned that one right here, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, and then in terms of internet marketing, there's social media marketing. Who here has a Facebook page? Okay, I think you're lying, Max. You don't have a Facebook page? I'm sorry, you have to leave. <laughs> um, so almost everyone has a Facebook page. There's places to use Facebook, and there's places to use LinkedIn. Who has a LinkedIn account? Okay, he has a LinkedIn account. You can you can stay. <laughs> um, there's places to use LinkedIn account. I'll talk about that in in a minute. Um, social media marketing. There are some types of business, usually business to consumer, where social me media marketing is very powerful in actually driving customers. Uh, in business to business. Uh, we see that it's good for generating, creating relationships with customers. It's just not as effective for actually driving, driving business. Um, how, having said that, you should have a LinkedIn account and be doing active things on your LinkedIn account. So, who is looking for your business? Who is looking for your business? Customers. Customers, right? We call them prospects before the customers, right? They, they, you hope that they become customers. And who else might be looking for your business? Competitors. Competitors. All right, so I like to talk about competitors just a little bit because there's one aspect of pay-per-click that can drive your competitors <laughs> mad. Does that sound exciting? Who wants to drive their competitors mad, right? So what would drive your competitors mad? To see uh, your ad on their listing. Uh, that, if we could do that, we would. <laughs> We're still working on that technology. If they just see your ad everywhere, right? If they just see your ad everywhere. So that's something that we'll talk about. When, when, you, uh, when your uh, competitors visit your site and they end up seeing your ad everywhere. Um, all right, so everybody recognize all of these logos? What's, this is the one that's probably the rarest. Google Plus. Google Plus. Does it, who has a Google Plus? He has a Google Plus account, but no Facebook. That's odd. <laughs> and I've known him for a long time, so I'm not surprised. Uh, so, so Google Plus is kind of the new kid on the block. What's the? Does anybody know the value of Google Plus? Why should you have a Google Plus account? All right. So the the real reason. Yes. Is by Google after all, and so naturally, when you post onto a social network by Google, you're naturally experiencing an increase in your rank in search engines because Google really wants you to be active on Google Plus. Yes, absolutely, and your G Plus local listing. So that's when you have the little tabs. Uh, the little pins and the map. So we've all done a search, and I have a screen that'll show this in a little bit. Um, that's related to your G Plus one of your G Plus accounts. There's a G Plus local account, which can be merged with your G Plus account. So there's value in having a G Plus account uh, because when you're active on it, Google knows that you're active, and they know very well and very specifically because it's a Google product. So who is the, what company is the leader on this screen? YouTube, Google, and Facebook. <laughs> So, in terms of time, it probably is Facebook in terms of utilization. In terms of search, there's actually one company that has the two search engines up here that are the biggest. Google and YouTube. Google, Google and YouTube. Google and YouTube. So they're both, YouTube is, a, uh, is actually a Google product. So when people ask me, um, because I'm very direct and simple, because Nolan will have a different answer. When they ask me where should I put my videos, should I put it in lots of places? Well, the answer is yes, and if I were to only put it in one place, where should I put it? It should be on YouTube, right? Because it is a Google product, right? So um, if you're making videos, make sure they're on there. I don't know if you know, did you know that YouTube is the second largest search engine, right? So the first amount of searches happen on Google, the second happen on YouTube. And I should remember some insane stat about a year of video gets uploaded every hour or something. It's, yeah. it's, it's, I don't know what it is. It's something like that. It's insane how much video gets uploaded. So with video, it's about standing apart. Yes, sir. But it's also because they make money when, when they have, uh, like, let's say, a million views or something like that. And that's why people are more interested in putting videos on YouTube. Than As opposed to some of the others that, that maybe you don't get paid. Absolutely. Yeah. They're hoping that their video will go viral and that, and that they can make some money. All right, so from straight internet marketing, so this is kind of pulling back from social media. From straight internet marketing, there really are two ways to get traffic from search, right? One is the quick way, one is the slow way. 
right? Which way do we prefer? <laughs> right? Well, maybe. Because what if I told you the slow way, although it takes longer, gets 75% more traffic? Than the slow way. Than the slow way, right? <laughs> Except how long are you willing to invest in the slow way? And we'll talk about that. So the quick way, let's see what's coming up. The quick way is called pay per click. We can literally have your website on the first page of Google tomorrow, right? We just got to make a pay per click account. You've got to put some sort of budget into Google, and then we can have your ad showing tomorrow. And we actually insist all of our clients do pay per click account because SEO is a process that takes time. So you may see your website increase in position. So let's say your website's currently on page five. You start doing search engine optimization. You're on page four, you're on page three. You're seeing progress. Let's say you get to page two. There's a joke. I don't know if anybody's heard this joke. Where do you hide a dead body on page two of Google? Because nobody will look there. So even though you're seeing progress in your position, that's not going to be generating any or much revenue. Does that make sense? Right? So it's until you get into position on the first page and even until you get into the top half of that first page that you really start generating revenue. So that can take months to happen. It's one of the reasons we insist that you do pay-per-click. So let's kind of look at a, at a typical search and break down all the parts of this. Did you have a, was there a question? No. Um, look, this is very clearly highlighted as ads. It used to be just shaded. Does everybody remember when it used to just be slightly shaded and then this was labeled as ads? So this is pay-per-click. And well, let me just describe real quick how this works. So this company, FuelFX, has given a budget to Google. Let's say they've given $1,000 to Google. And they said, if anybody clicks through to my website, I'm willing to pay up to eight bucks, let's say. So when you see this ad here, they've paid nothing. It's one of the reasons all of our ads have phone numbers in them. Because if they pick up the phone and they call, how much have you paid? Zero, Zero and you got a phone call, right? So if you're running pay-per-click ads, make sure that you have phone numbers in them. Also make sure they're tracking phone numbers so that you know where the call came from. So, so this is pay-per-click ads. This typically works, and this will be exaggerated, but this position is $10, this position is $9, this position is $8, and these continue to de decrease in cost. So when you click through, how much does it cost? It costs less over on this side. So where do you want your ad? Right below. Right up top? Is that so right here? No, below the paid ads. So right well. Yes, sir. <laughs> Absolutely. This is called the organic section. You're jumping the gun. We'll get to it in a second. Um, so if you have a thousand dollars and you're actually here, which costs significantly less, and you spend your full thousand dollars, what's the advantage of being here? We got more clicks, right? Because the cost per click is less expensive. Now, if you're not able to spend your full $1,000, you should be top bidding so that you're more likely to, this is called top bidding when you bid on this position. Um, you would want to top bid in order to make sure that you actually spend your full budget. Now, you also want to make sure you're testing and measuring and making sure that this has value, that you're getting a positive ROI out of it. But in general, we target this position or lower. Because if we can spend the full thousand dollars, we're getting you more clicks at a certain cost. We also, again, make sure that you've got uh, you've got your phone number there. Something else that's pretty important when you do a search. In this case, it's SEO Houston in Houston. When you do a search on this, you want to make sure that you actually have most, if not all, of the phrases that you searched in your ad. We call that continuity. And if you listen to our podcast, you'll hear us talk about this regularly. When I search SEO in Houston, I want to see SEO in Houston, or at least Houston SEO in my ad, at which point I'll click through, and then I land on a page, and what do I want to see on that page? SEO, SEO in Houston, right? Because if I land there and all I see are cute cats, I'm probably going to leave. I'm going to do what's called a bounce and leave right away. Unless you love cats and now you're distracted for another hour, and <laughs> that's, a, that's a different story. Um, so you want to make sure that you've got continuity in your, in your uh, pay-per-click ads. Next, this is the organic section. It is comprised, and this is what SEO is trying to achieve. So Google tells us 75% of clicks on a page like this will happen from here down, right? So only 25% of clicks happen in the pay-per-click area. 
So it's, it's pretty easy to argue that if you're willing to spend $1,000 on pay-per-click, you should be willing to spend $4,000, $3,000 on organic, on organic efforts, right? Because the value should be there. 75% of clicks are happening there. Does that make sense? In this, is that a yes? Yes. Yes. All right, good. We got good energy. All right. So um, this section is called Google Local. G plus local now, it's blended where your G plus local account is actually combined with your, uh, with your regular website. So good organic SEO, search engine optimization, will get you here as well as a complete Google plus local listing. Um, this is, and the reason I'm circled up over there, not because I think I'm handsome, it's because to remind me that I'm actually logged in. And when you're logged into Google, the results you see are different than when you're not logged in. So we get, we get calls from clients who are like, I just search for, first we get clients who say, I'm on the first page of Google. What are you on the first page of Google for? My business name, okay? So don't be proud of that. If you're not on the first page for your business name, then you have done something horribly wrong. Literally horribly wrong. It should be very easy to place for your name. Why should it be easy for you to place well for your name? It's unique. It's unique. Who else is going to be talking about you? Your mom. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank so you know, <laughs> you've, you've searched me. My mom's page out ranks me. <laughs> <laughs> right. So no one else is searching. No one else is talking about your business on their website. At least not as much as your business should be talking about your business. So placing well for your business should be very easy. Um, then they'll also say, okay, well now I search the service of my business and I'm on the first page. So I type in the same service, whatever it is, roofing in Houston, and they're not on the first page. And the reason is, is because as soon as you visit a website, so imagine you're looking for roofing in Houston and you look up roofing in Houston and you click one or two websites. And then a week later, you still haven't got your roof replaced. It's raining again. You have a roof leak, right? What are you gonna do? You're going to go back to the internet and you very, Google believes you very well may want one of the websites that you already visited. So whatever you visited in the past shows up. So imagine if you have a roofer in your networking group, you visited his website. When you go to search for roofing in Houston, whether he has great placement or not, he or she is more likely to show up. Does that make sense? So it's important actually, um, and this is Chrome. I don't know who you hear uses Chrome. Oh, wow. Awesome. Yes. Awesome. So uh, I think on the, the little free tabs way over there on the right, there's an option to go incognito. If you do incognito, then it doesn't track you, it doesn't share cookies, it doesn't share anything. And then when you do a search, you're gonna get the real result. And that result is gonna change from, based on location, right? So does anybody remember when you could go to the web and type dentist, and you could actually find a dentist on the first page for you in Los Angeles? Right, do you remember that? And now when you type dentist, what happens? Local. It's local. It knows where you are based on your IP address. So this entire collection of information is related to the map. Yes? Chris, what are you logged into? So that's just my Google account, Google oh. Apps. Oh, this. So if you have a Gmail oh, account. Gmail. That was, so you're logged into Gmail. Yes. As soon as you're logged into Gmail or any sort of Google product, then okay. that, that will be the case. OK. So, um, so it's local. Google knows your IP address, he knows where your IP address is supposed to be based, and it shows you local results. So it's one of the things, the most important thing that you can do is get your G plus local page up and running. Because if somebody's searching at least in your immediate vicinity, you have a significantly higher opportunity to show. Yes? What's the difference between a Gmail account and a G plus local? Listing? You're a couple clicks away from having a G plus local page um, you w very well may have a G plus local listing, depending on the type of business. You say a G plus local listing, just my name and phone number, or? Well, so it's usually related to business, and they kind of pull it off of business listings, and so they'll end up trading. So these are all, if you click maps and search for your business name, you'll know if you have a G plus local listing. Is that, is that what you're looking for? No? So you see maps right there? Maps. That short, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, okay. right there. So that takes you to Google Maps, and then if you search for your business name, if you have a G Plus local listing, then you can, uh, uh -huh. then you will, you will show up there. So and if I don't have a G Plus listing, 
which is my name, my profession, my company, my address, my phone number, whatever else they ask for. That's the key plus listing. Yes. And that feeds into the mapping. Yes. Okay. Exactly. And so you start with, well, they, again, some often if you're a business, they'll create a listing for you, depending on how long the, the, how long it's been available on whatever databases that they tap. Um, and they're you know, related to creating a business, phone numbers, whatever. Um, so that you also, you may need to just go claim it. Right? Yes? I'm going to add to that, you can't add yourself to Google Maps. You can literally go in and add your business if you have a storefront. Um, they will not physically add it until they verify that you are the owner. Yep. So what they do is they'll send you a verification code via mail to the office. Once you receive it, you verify the code. And you show up on uh, Google Maps. And then again, this is integrated with your search engine optimization efforts. So, what kind of search engine optimization do you have on your website? And uh, and it's very localized. So, it's one of the things that you can do as a small business is make sure your G Plus local page is complete. And complete means you should have, uh, I think it's five images, three videos. You need to list your hours. Do you take credit cards? Is there parking? All of that stuff that you need to fill out that profile that impacts whether you show up here. Also, reviews are very important, uh, whether you show up there. Um, and it's just a very easy way to get business in your very immediate area. Does that make sense? Because if people are searching for what you do in the immediate area, Google, and it's a local type of service, yes? Okay, so I'm a little bit confused. Google Plus is the most rare kind of thing for people to have, but what it sounds like you're saying is it's most important, but if people don't have it, I mean, what's the effect so let me, let me explain that. There's actually two types of G Plus pages. One is a G Plus page, which is really like your Facebook page, except on G Plus. And then there's a G Plus local page. Okay. You probably have one already because you're an established business. Whether you made it or not, whether you hired anyone to do internet marketing for you or not, you probably have a page. It's probably just sitting there waiting to be claimed and completed. Does that make sense? So kind of like they used to draw information out of yellow pages and now you had your listing and that's how they showed your listing and then you just have to go claim it, right? So yes, yes, it's not used very often and G plus local is, is used very often because how often do you see that map? Every time it's a local service. One note, SE, uh, SEO, I had a, you'll notice it says in Houston. I actually had to put the word in Houston to force Google to give me a local result. Because if I just do SEO in SEO Houston, Google thinks that it's a service, and well, it is, that you can get anywhere. So it doesn't consider it a local search. That makes sense? So just like if you were to type vacation, it's not going to give you vacation spots in your zip code, right? It's going to give you whoever is placed well for vacations. So I actually had to force it by using the word in on that. Yes, sir. Did you say that eWebStyle is on there because you're, this is your page? Or is, are you guys on there? But I work here also. I'm also. But that's in, what you said a while ago. Yeah, for this search, I'm also in my area, immediate area. So, and we place well in general, as you can imagine. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Most of the time. Um, any other questions? Any questions? Have I added too much information? For most of us. <laughs> All right, let me just make, okay, good. All right, so you do well here. You have a great local pay, local listing, so you show up when people search for you. You have good pay-per-click. By the way, there's a couple reasons to have pay-per-click. So I described one as being slow and one as being fast, right? So you want to do the fast one, which is pay-per-click right away. And then as you start getting better organic placement, one might argue, hey, I should get rid of my pay-per-click ad, right? Because that seems to make sense. Except we've got data that shows the opposite. There's two things. One, if you're spending money here or here, wherever it is, and it has a positive ROI, should you stop it? No. No, right? So as long as you're keeping track, as you're testing and measuring, and you've got a positive ROI in this place, even if you get that position, and maybe that one and that one, SEO Houston's because it's in their name, um, if you get those two positions, you should still run pay-per-click ads, right? Because if they're working, they're working. There are people who don't get past this spot. There are people whose eyes always go over there. There are just people who think differently, act differently, click differently than you or I or some, anybody in this room may. And if it's working, don't stop it. 
The other thing is, when you get good organic placement, there are a number of white papers out there that say, all right, so let's test this. It's a pretty, thing, pretty easy thing to test. I've got great organic placement. I've got my pay-per-click ads. Let me turn off my pay-per-click ads. What impact does it have on my business? Every paper we read says it has a negative impact on their business. So they, they lose revenue by stopping pay-per-click. Not only that, this gets less clicks when you're not running a pay-per-click ad. Does anybody have any theories as to why that might be? Why, if I see an ad here and here, let's say we saw fuel FX here, why might it get more clicks here than if that ad weren't there? You're seeing it twice. You're seeing it twice, right? Just in general awareness, right? So as you scan down the page, oh, I'm going to skip ads. I don't click pay-per-click ads. Boom, you've already seen it, so subconsciously it hits. The other theory that we have is actually credibility. Right, so when you see something that's on the very first top section or over there, and they have another position, you just tend to believe that they're a more credible company, right? It's a larger company, they're spending money on advertising, they probably know what they're doing. Um, and we actually have some confirmation of that. Uh, uh, my brother-in-law works with Toys R Us and was in charge of their pay-per-click campaign. And they saw the, they didn't see the opposite, they just didn't see the same effect, right? So when they cancel their pay-per-click ads, it doesn't, increase or decrease, it actually increases clicks here. And the reason is, is because it's Toys R Us, right? Two ads doesn't convince you that Toys R Us is a reputable company. Toys R Us is a reputable company in and of itself, right? That makes sense? So those are the things that cause us to want our clients or insist our clients run both pay-per-click ads and, we all, and organic. And we only run pay-per-click ads that are profitable. All right, so now you've done all of this, you drive them to your website, what do you do next? Oh, really, what do you do next? Yeah. <laughs> some sort of... Uh, get them on the phone, some sort of... Capture information. Call to action. Have some sort of call to action. So what kind of things do you need to have on your webpage to make sure that they actually want to engage with you? So that they, that they have some sense of reliability and some sense of trust. And we break it down into three things. Two of them are related to reliability and trust, and one of them is related to, let's make sure we know that we're telling them what we want them to do. Because in general, people, if you don't tell them, hey, click here, or click call for free XYZ, they don't. You know, The phone number may sit there, the form may sit there, you're not giving them instructions, they tend not to do it, right? That's, at least that's what we see. So. We have a USP, a CCP, and a CTA. USP, unique selling proposition. Who has heard of a unique selling proposition? Does anybody, does anybody have a unique selling proposition in this room that they would like to share? In a minute? <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else? Who's working on one? Right? Working on one. Who, who after this is going to go yeah, work right. on one? <laughs> Right? A unique selling proposition is why should I do, is the thing that explains why they should do business with you and not with somebody else. Right? So you should do business with me because I'm a sole proprietor. Maybe that's a benefit in a certain industry. You should do business with me because I'm a large company. That's a benefit in certain situations. You can do, you should do business with me because I turn homes around in three days. Three days was the one this morning. In three days, right? With multiple bids. The market's still good. So um, that's that's why, and, and you want to share with yours, Andrew? <laughs> um, I worked on it about a year ago, so I'm trying to put it together again. Uh, I, I did a brochure, a revamped a brochure, and it's in my brochure. I'm just not recalling exactly what it was, but it goes something to the effect that um, I get to help people uh, with uh, uh, the American dream. Right? And so your focus is helping people live the American dream, yes. right? And if that's not somebody else's focus, that's a unique selling proposition. <laughs> Absolutely. By the way, I have a couple of people I know I've noticed have come in and have not had lunch. If you don't want lunch, that's great. If you do, feel free to go over and grab it at any point. Um, all right, so unique selling proposition. How, and everyone's heard of unique. So how many people have heard of CCP? But you came to my last set. <laughs> <laughs> Confidence and credibility piece. So we actually made this, this phrase up because 
USP doesn't apply to everything, right? So as an example, if you're going to do business with a plumber, what um, do you kind of expect that the plumber has a BBB, a good BBB rating? So it's not really a unique selling proposition. Hopefully all the plumbers that you're interviewing to come and visit to your home have a good BBB, excuse me, BBBA <laughs> bank account and a, a good BBB rating. BBB is a better business than your own. Um, so it's not unique, it's just a confidence and credibility piece. So you see that, maybe you see some of their licensing, you see board certified for an attorney. Those are not unique selling prop propositions, they are just confidence and credibility pieces. So we want to have those. Uh, and then we want to have the call to action. We're one of the few, so I described it earlier and let me just make sure that it's clear. When somebody visits one page on your website and then immediately, immediately leaves, so they haven't visited anything else, they've just visited the one page, that's called a bounce. And most web companies, whether it be traffic or actually websites, people who make websites or who send traffic, are always harping on having a very low bounce rate. And we're probably the only internet marketing company that say in certain situations, a high bounce rate is exactly what you want. And the reason is, is if they come and they pick up the phone, let's see, we couldn't convince them to pick up the phone at that ad, right? We've got the phone number here. Let's say we couldn't, in our short ad, convince them to pick up the phone, but they came to our website and they didn't visit any other page and they picked up the phone. Is that a bad thing? It can't, it can't get any better than that. And that's gonna be recorded in Google Analytics and, and statistics for your website as a bounce. Right, so we're one of the few companies, and, and, and in general we say, we spend all of this time putting amazing content for the user, for Google. We put this content together so that Bing recognizes it, so that it places well, so that it reads well, and we desperately hope no one reads it. Yes, sir? So the bounce, I thought the bounce was just somebody saw your site and went to another page right away. If they go on your first page and just sit there for 20 minutes reading everything, and they leave, they don't go deeper, that's a bounce. That's a bounce. How about that? Yeah, it's got, you've got to get further than one page. Okay. Now, a form submission, if it's done right, actually has a thank you page, and so a form submission can't be a bounce, right, if they fill out the form. So that's what we're pushing for usually, is a phone call or a form submission so that they actually um, engage with your business. Um, so we desperately don't want them to read any of it. Because what we prefer, and, and in fact it depends on the business, there are some businesses that want people to download a, a paper, there are some businesses that want the phone call, maybe they want some different steps, they just want you to sign up for the newsletter. In those cases, um, that's, that's the target, that's the goal. But when it comes to it being a phone number or filling out a form, bounces are great. What's a bounce on a blog? If you do a blog, yep. and you get action on your website from that blog, and you got a, let's say you got a 50% bounce rate. What does that mean? Because they they picked they clicked on the blog because they maybe picked it up in Facebook or, or right. LinkedIn or something else. So they had to click on it. Yep. So in Facebook, it, since it's not your website, if they click through to an article that's on your blog, that's the very first page that they visited on your website slash blog. And if that's all they read. And in your in, in the number you gave, 50% of the people are coming reading the one page, and then let's be realistic, probably going back to Facebook <laughs> or going somewhere else, not okay, on your So website. if I place a blog, which I do, on LinkedIn, and I show a 60% bounce rate in my analytics, yep. you're telling me that that doesn't mean that they left in a millisecond. That means they- They could have stayed and read the whole article. Now, in Google Analytics, it will tell you how long those people stayed. So as an example, you may have a 100% bounce rate, and six. you know, if you have a six minute video, you may have a 100% bounce rate and six minute time on site, right? So everyone could come and watch the one but video and go. Six minutes is an average. You, yes. So, I mean, the theoretical extreme of all bounces is the six minute video. So they come, it's potential that you could have, a, all of the people come watch the whole video and leave and it would still be considered a bounce. Yes. So, so just to clarify, bounce rate means that they went to only one page on your website and then left? Yes. yes. And bounce rates are generally considered bad but you're saying not really? It, it depends. It depends. And why, why are they considered bad? 
because if they it, so mo, what, what most web designers are looking to show you statistics where oh look your web your web content is so engaging that they're visiting five pages in three and 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 they're spending ten minutes on your site okay. and those are actually good statistics we follow those also they're just often unaware they're so unfocused on on business value mm -hmm. that for them a bounce is always bad okay. does that make sense. And, and our focus is entirely business value. If they come in, literally, if I could cut the traffic, the, the time on your site in half and double your phone calls, business owner, do you like that? Right, I mean, and I'm in a business where I'm not selling anything on the internet. I just want them to pick up the phone and call us. Yep, or drive in. Or drive in. Right, 50% of searches happen on mobile devices now. So your website needs to be mobile friendly and it has to have a quick map, right? right? So how do you know who's read the blog or not? You, you don't, for sure. You just look at the time. You don't you, on an individual basis. You don't know, right? But you you can statistically know who's who's actually. Yeah. And the and just to add to that, Dan, the reason they do that is so you don't call people back and say you lied and said you read it and you didn't read it. So that's why they don't give you all the information. I'm sorry. Continue. That's, the that's, that's later. You cover that in a <laughs> in a later section. All the agreements for the post for So, so yes, sir. Are they uh, are they tracking if you mark the page to read later? Because I, I mean, I know that throughout the day, I don't have time to read all the stuff I come across, and I don't want to. I mean, time management doesn't allow me to. But I often will mark it and go back and read full page later. So they're so. probably not tracking that you've marked it, although they could. I don't think they are. I don't see statistics on that. They will show when you've come back. So one of the okay. statistics Google Analytics will say is how many people are visiting your website for the second time. You know, if it's a you know on week one of your website launch, a hundred percent of your visits will be brand new visits. Let's say week two, fifty percent of those people came back. So now, and you kept the same volume. So fifty percent of your website website traffic would be new. Fifty percent would be repeat. So it does keep it keep track of it in that sense. One of the things, um, let me go back to this, and it's a component I don't have a slide for. Uh, and I, I really enjoy this part because it's where you get to frustrate your competitors. Um, this is all controlled, how you run it, how you manage it, what keywords you target, how much you bid is controlled from a system in Google called AdWords. And AdWords has what's called retargeting. So who here has heard of retargeting? All right, so we've got two. And I want everyone to put your hands up. Everyone put your hands up. I want to let you know you have experienced retargeting. Let me describe what retargeting is. It's when you go to a website and you're shopping for something and you leave that website and you're on other websites and you see that exact something you were finding, what you were searching for. Yep, that's happened to everyone. It's kind of a little creepy, right? And wonderful if it's your business. The way it works is when somebody visits your website, we drop a cookie on their browser. It's actually a Google cookie. So then when you're surfing the internet and you encounter web pages, websites that are part of Google's ad network, your ad shows up. So again, your competitors visit your website, uh, the cookie gets dropped on their browser, as they're going to MSN, Fox News, ESPN, they're seeing your ad over and over and over again. They're pulling their hair out because you're spending so much money, right? No, it's incredibly inexpensive. Incredibly inexpensive because Banner ads are sold in the cost per thousand, in the dollar per thousand impressions. So you're you're at pennies, fractions of pennies for each banner ad you so show, and that's all it's doing is saying, okay, um, I've dropped a cookie, I'm on ESPN, and I'm willing to pay double what the average banner is because this particular individual has already visited my website, right? So now you're at two fractions of a penny per ad. Additionally, on day one, say you launch your website where we put that cookie on your website, your audience is at zero. There's nobody who has that cookie yet. So on day one, you have no audience to be showing your ads to. It starts to accumulate because traffic's coming to your website. That makes sense? We do re retargeting and remarketing both on Facebook, because it happens on Facebook now, and on, on uh, with Google AdWords for every client. It just, it's what we do when we put together a website. Any questions? Anybody want to try that and follow their follow their competitors around? So I have a funny uh, retargeting story. About six years ago, we were looking at adoption, so we started looking up adoption agencies. Well, somewhere shortly after that, we uh, found an exchange program, 
And so we haven't got a, we haven't adopted baby, but we have had ten kids through exchange. So I mean, I strongly believe that, that was straight. They were following you. Retargeting. Yeah. I had a, uh, a, a gentleman in my in my networking group who came up and says, "How'd you get on Fox News?" At first, I was like, "I don't, I don't know." I, I didn't even know I was on Fox News, and then I realized it was FoxNews.com. He saw my ad on FoxNews.com because he visited my website. Hey, just to add to that, Tim, I, I really thought you were going somewhere different with it thought, because I don't know if you guys know when the retargeting happens, it's specific items, right? So like these shoes that I have on, if I looked at these shoes in Amazon, these specific shoes, so I thought you were looking at a particular kid like Billy. <laughs> and he was and following you around. everywhere. And he was just like, nobody wants Billy. I need to help Billy. I just, I'm just saying. I, and just, pictures, I had no idea. The pictures just keep getting sadder and sadder. Exactly. <laughs> Billy's suffering because you haven't adopted him yet. I thought he was going there too. Right, I was like, don't tell me it was the same kid every time you clicked a different site. Like, really? You left me? Really? I was in the shopping cart, but let's go. I'm sorry. I was in the I'm shopping cart. Is that like a yes. banner, right? It's a banner. It shows a banner on yep. the side. And, and there's, and there's it, something else. When we do that, we have to actually make three, I think it's four banner types, a square across the top and rectangular across the top. Yeah, across the side. The side. And then Facebook is just text. On the flip side of that, is there any way for the consumer end to get rid of those banners? Yes, clear your cookies. Okay, that's, that's it. it. Oh God. Clear your cookies. Clear your cookies. <laughs> you can get you can get rid of me. All you have to do is clear the cookies. You know, it's driving me nuts. And now, now that I think about it. So they know what you buy. Yeah. yeah, or and, and what you haven't purchased because the yeah. smart ones when you make the purchase will actually pull that cookie out of your cart and won't continue to show you the same item, right? So Which on the retargeting, is that something you actually say separate for in addition to Google AdWords? It's in the same AdWords campaign. So if you ever have a Google AdWords campaign retargeting as part of that you, automatically? You, no, you have to turn it on and upload ban. I mean, yes, and you've got to turn it on and add banners and, and those kinds. So there are things you have to put in place to make it happen. And and it's fairly complex. In my office, Charles takes care of it. I actually jumped into it to kind of look at it the other day and I got lost. <laughs> so, anything else? All right. Um, let's go through this. I've got a little video. Greg just started his new plumbing business. He has a few customers, and he knows in order to be successful, he's going to need more business. He decides the solution is to make a great website, and he's lucky because his uncle knows how to make websites. So Greg hires his uncle, his uncle makes him a website, and oh, what a great website it is. All his existing customers love it, his friends and family rave about it. There's only one problem. Oh. I'm sorry, nobody told me it wasn't showing up here. <laughs> I thought this was what you were working on. I thought you were working on us. It's it's a very dramatic. Yeah. It builds up from nothing. I <laughs> 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 right. what you were doing, Chris. Let's try. It's not the video it's guy. This is right. He's embarrassing you, know. I have just been doing it. Allow me to there. allow me to tell you a story. Meet Greg. Greg just started his new plumbing business. He has a few customers, and he knows in order to be successful, he's going to need more business. He decides the solution is to make a great website, and he's lucky because his uncle knows how to make websites. So Greg hires his uncle, his uncle makes him a website, and oh, what a great website it is. All his existing customers love it, his friends and family rave about it. There's only one problem, Greg is getting no new business. Now meet Brenda. Brenda's a consultant and has been consulting for five years, and over that time, she has managed to put together a great website. Just like Greg, all her existing clients, family, and friends love her website. There's only one problem. She is looking to grow, and if she's going to grow, she knows that she's going to need more business. So she decides the solution is more traffic to her website. So she hires a company to send more traffic to her website. That company does a great job. Traffic to her website skyrockets. There's only one problem. Just like Greg, Brenda is getting no new business. Brenda does not know if there's something wrong with her website or maybe the traffic being sent to her website is wrong. All Brenda knows is she is getting no new business. Finally, meet Scott. Scott is an experienced entrepreneur just about to launch his latest business. His existing customer base is small and just like Greg and Brenda, he is going to want more business. He's a little smarter or maybe a little luckier than Greg and Brenda. Scott goes to the internet and Google's internet marketing Houston. 
He finds a new web style on the first page. The new web style meets with him, creates a great website for him, drives lots of traffic to that website, and then makes sure that that traffic actually turns into business. Because you see, it doesn't matter if you have a great website. It doesn't matter if you have lots of traffic to that website. The only thing that really matters is that you get more business. E-Web Style is in the business of getting your company more business. So I showed this video for a couple of reasons. We're getting close to, to Nolan's part, and so I just want to show you the impact of video. Video has a really, can explain a lot of complex details in a very short period of time, and Nolan's going to show that. Uh, additionally, it's just what, if you're going to engage with an internet marketing company, understand, are, is their focus a pretty website, is their focus lots of traffic, or is their focus actually growing your business? And it's important, because at the end of the day, I always say that our clients don't care if you have a pretty website, if they have a pretty website, or if they have lots of traffic. If I could send five people, uh, and those five people became customers, a lot of my customers would be very happy. They don't care if a thousand people show up or not, all they care is five or whatever number become customers. I don't know why it's showing me that part. Let's try this. Oh. That's nice. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for Chris Burroughs. <laughs> give it up for Chris Burroughs. All right, so just running out of time, I want to go quickly over uh, a couple of websites. I mentioned Susan Manning in the beginning. Uh, this is her new website. Uh, we keep things very simple. We want to drive people. Uh, I spoke about continuity earlier. And in continuity, there are three things that they ended up on the home page. If they did a search, they would probably actually end up inside of the pool equipment page, the pool renovation page, the pool maintenance page. Um, and if they ended up on the home page, we just want people to find what they're looking for. The form is short. A note about forms, if you have forms on your website, make sure that they are as short as possible and that they are also physically unintimidating. You can imagine, just for a second, imagine that this form were this whole page. Does it make you more or less likely to want to fill it out? Yes. Did I change anything? Is it more work? No. That's why they should be small. You actually see that we put the name, the description is not a label between or in front of, it's actually in there. As small as we can make that, the better, because it's an unassuming form. Great, I fill out information, boom, I've got contact. The phone number is strong. Actually, this is an older version of the website. This, this is some, somewhat changed. The call to action is actually pretty weak in this one, so it really should be call for a free quote, call for a free cleaning, whatever we're brainstorming with our client on a monthly basis for uh, for whatever they're doing, uh, whatever promotion they're running. And let me not take up any more. This is another client in Virginia. We'll skip this. All right, so we didn't really talk about identifying prospects. Um, that's just a short segment on if, um, if you think about who your best prospects are, the best way to identify them is to look at your current client base, right? because those are exactly the people that you want. People who weren't customers, who became customers. So what is their profile? Spend some time figuring out what profile you have in your existing client base, because those are the people you need to be targeting for as your prospects. Um, find out where they hang, hang out. And in our podcast, we often say, um, I think that's on this one, uh, don't throw money against the wall and see if it sticks. Actually have a plan of action and make sure that you're continuously following that plan month after month. 